Hello, uh, Maya Hool. Hello. Hello, <laughs> it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, now, for those uh, people at home who don't know, uh, this lovely lady here got in touch via the Facebook page um, last week, I believe, uh, linked with a, a news story to do with the, the reconstruction of a Bronze Age face. Now, this is very exciting stuff, and uh, I would love to know more about it. So can you possibly just, uh, well, first of all, introduce yourself and, and what, what, what this whole project is? Okay, yeah, sure, of course. So, I'm Maya. Um, and I run what's known as the Akavanic Beaker Burial Project. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that well, never I never intended it to end up as a project. Um, it was I was working for a local council, and um, one of my jobs in my position was to do social media posts. So I was looking through the um, the HR database mm -hmm. um, for interesting sites to post about, and I came across the site record for this uh, site, uh, Akavanic. Um, and I was absolutely fascinated, so I um, asked the team if they would mind if I took the file home and sort of read it and um, if I maybe started to do some research on it. Mm -hmm. And two years down the line, I'm still doing research. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what was it about, about Akhavanich um, which, okay. which intrigued you? What, 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 what got your attention? Um, well, it's a site that we had a an incomplete archive for it, mm -hmm. um, but we had enough tantalising little hints that it um, it looked like it could be really interesting if somebody spent some time on it. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, I thought I would do that. So we didn't have any site plans originally, but I have recreated them. I'm happy to send you um, send you them if you want to have a look at them. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Um, lots of different things. Um, I started doing lots of research myself and sort of looking at it in context of other beaker burials mm -hmm. and then um, I started to do lots of research collaboration and part of that has been the collaboration with Hugh who's done the facial reconstruction. Right, okay. So, yeah. so um, for those, for those, again, for those people who don't know, uh, what is a beaker burial? A beaker burial, okay, so this is um, a Bronze Age site. Mm -hmm. Um, the Beaker people, um, or Bell Beaker people, they're sometimes known as, or the Beaker folk, um, you find them all over um, Europe. Um, and they tend to be, the most evidence that we tend to have of them is from the burial record. Um, and they are known as the Beaker folk because they are buried with beakers, um, just like this replica that I have mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. readily prepared. <laughs> Um, so they're clay pots, um, they tend to come in different sizes and shapes, sometimes you get um, cremations included in them, sometimes you might find tools inside of them, um, but generally they're in the burial, um, included in burials and that's what, what these people were named after. We don't actually know if they were used as beakers, um, but when they were first found by antiquarians they thought that they looked like beakers, mm -hmm. so that's named them that so that's who the beaker people are okay okay and um well what what uh is it that then that, that um Hugh brought to this project then in february earlier this year um i was on the the bbc and um, i was approached by um the reporter and mm. um, he came across my facebook page and i uh, was interested in doing a piece on um on the site because it's been 30 years since it was discovered um and what ended up happening was this the BBC article was picked up by the local Caithness Courier mm -hmm. and um, we started to spread word um, about it to the local community to see if anybody remembered anything. But Hugh saw um, the BBC article and uh, he got in touch um, oh, probably four or five months ago now um, and we started talking. Um, he's has a um, an MSc in forensic art from the University of Dundee. Okay. And the University of Dundee, I believe, is the only university in the country that offers this course. Right. So there's not many people that can do it. Mm -hmm. And he is, uh, he graduated in 2014. So he's um, trying to set up himself up mm -hmm. uh, as a forensic artist. And uh, he thought this would be an interesting one to work on because he hadn't worked on any um, Bronze Age sites. Mm. So he got in touch and offered his services. Right, okay. Now, uh, do you know anything about um, uh, the technique then that he used to reconstruct a face? Because that's essentially what we're talking about, isn't it? They're taking a skull from the site and reconstructing what this person looked like. Do you, do you know anything about that? Yes, uh, he's uh, been very good and, and sort of talked me through the process mm -hmm. quite 
really, so I'll try and do it justice. Um, what we decided was to do a two-dimensional reconstruction. Um, with three-dimensional reconstructions, they're much harder to do for really old, fragile remains, because mm -hmm. you tend to have to do a casting of the skull, um, and it can be quite damaging. If you, you know, they're very precious things. So, mm. uh, so what we decided to do was to stick to a two-dimensional. Um, also because uh, the top of the nose um, has suffered a little bit of damage and um, we're missing the lower jaw, we thought it'd be quite difficult to recreate the profile of the face. Um, so that's why we, sorry, that's my computer just singing it. That's okay. <laughs> we thought that we would just stick to using um, a two-dimensional image. Mm -hmm. So what we did, um, he came uh, round um, to where I had uh, had the skull, and uh, we propped up so that because the the mandibles um, missing, generally it sits sort of um, like this, where we wanted it to be like this. So we set it up on a on a, a sort of pe pedestal mm -hmm. um, to get it looking face on. And that's because the, the essentially the the teeth at the top at uh, the top of the mouth were pushing the head back when it was on a flat surface. It's, well, because yeah. you're missing the, the lower part of the uh, of the skull, mm. it, and we're missing the bones at the back, mm -hmm. the occipital bone, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. So it just meant that it didn't sit in a natural position no. because no. of what we were missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so then um, he took photographs from, I think it was about six feet away, so that you don't get any distortion from the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we made sure that we had a, a measurement, um, like a scale reference in the photograph. So we took lots of photographs from lots of different angles, and that's what he used to um, base the reconstruction on. Right. Um, and then what he does is, oh, it's all magical what he does. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll send you a photograph of the skull so you can see, but um, one of the cheekbones um, that has uh, been damaged at some point mm. in antiquity. So what he, he did is take the measurements um, on both sides of the face and using the other side of the face, recre recreated that piece of bone that was missing. Right. Um, then what he did, let me see, what did he do next? Took measurements of all of the facial features mm -hmm. um, and um, things like uh, oh yes he did a he did an assessment of what um, what um, sort of age sex and ancestry he thought this individual would have had mm -hmm. so we had a um, uh, a specialist looked at the assemblage in the late nineties mm -hmm. and they said that this was. Um, a Caucasian, European Caucasian female. Um, female because the brow ridges are very small and, um, and the shape of the pelvis, although we don't have a huge amount of the pelvis surviving. Um, and also that she was quite young, um, mm. primarily based on the condition of the teeth. The teeth are, are, are not worn, um, not, not many cavities or anything, so okay. it looks like this is quite a, a young individual. And, and again, um, with the vertebra, um, there's, a, there's a certain point of your I believe of your vertebrae that um, um, forges together at a certain stage in, in, in your very late teens, early twenties. Mm -hmm. um, we um, we don't see that in her, so um, so that's why we think she's of that age. Okay. So that's why he based the reconstruction that he did um, of that age, sex, and gender. Mm -hmm. um, and then he used all these wonderful <laughs> research techniques that have been developed um, to do things like measure, you can tell the width of the mouth by um, it's between where your canines and your first molars, your premolars are, that's where the, the, the width of your mouth sits. Oh, yeah, 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 that works, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of poking my own face, yeah. <laughs> I gave a lecture today at, um, uh, to the staff at Historic Environment Scotland, and when I said that, everybody was proud. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it was very entertaining to watch. And you can also tell by the enamel on the front teeth mm -hmm. um, what the width of the lips would have been. Right. Okay. Yeah, and um, um, eyeballs I think are something like twenty-two or twenty-four millimeters in diameter. Mm -hmm. So he could um, he knew what what size that they should be to to recreate that. And then um, he used um, a formula, I can't remember the, the name of the, the gentleman who did it, but I believe it's um, an American anthropologist came up with this formula for reconstructing the, the, the size and shape of the jaw based on the rest of the skull. Mm -hmm. So he does all these clever calculations and measurements um, to figure that out. 
And then he um, looks at all of the facial muscles and reconstructs all of them. And then um, adds the skin on, on top, again to match the age, gender and sex of this individual. And then lastly, um, he was to decide on um, an appropriate hairstyle for this individual. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had lots of comments in the, in the, um, when people have seen the reconstructions on why have you given her red hair and why have you given her blue eyes. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for this is that um, the current population in that area um, have um, generally those kind of characteristics. So we thought that it would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, there's no reason that this couldn't have been what an individual looked like at this time. No, no, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> now, my, my understanding is that the, an awful lot of the sort of the measurements in terms of the because ultimately, uh, obviously, one of the big things about a face is essentially how how thick the flesh is. Um, did, was it a case of going for average depths of flesh on the face, or did you decide to make her fatter or thinner? I mean, what what how, what happened there? Again, yes, you're right. We went for average steps mm. of, um, because uh, essentially we used um, data from the average European Caucasian woman right. and tissue depths and, and used them, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, just using the average. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I suppose a, a final question, uh, broadly speaking, is what is the value of reconstructing a face? Uh, from the past, why, um, why bother? To be honest, I mean, you know, what, 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 what's, what's behind this, and and also, what have you got out of it? What have I got out of it? Oh man, I I was just astounded when I saw mm -hmm. it, and it's one of the best reconstructions I've ever seen. Um, I forgot to mention actually, um, the way that he does the the final stage is um, he has this database of what he calls um, donor faces, which I, I love. <laughs> concept um, and uh, he's got a especially large collection of, um, of European um, um, Caucasian faces and he selects the um, ones that, that fit best with um, the anatomy of the face and the muscles that have been built up and then he uses this really clever software that merges it all together. So why, why do a facial reconstruction? I think um, what I've found is that it really engages people with archaeology. It's a fantastic way of literally staring people right in the face and being like, look, this is what somebody looked like three, three and a half, almost 4,000 years ago. Mm. And the number of people that have come back and said, this is really interesting, it's fantastic. Um, and um, and as, as a reflection of that, my, my own Facebook page, uh, when I uh, that morning when I approached the BBC, I had about 474 followers. Mm -hmm. And then in the 10 days since then, I've got another 2,500, I'm almost at 3,000 followers right, now. Right. Um, and people want to know, they, they want to ask questions, they want to know why we've made the decisions we have, and they want to know more about the burial. Mm -hmm. So it's this huge number of people now um, are, are really engaged, and, and that's fantastic. That's what we want to engage people in archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so that's a very good answer. I know I, I asked it in a slightly harsh way, like why bother with this? But um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a, it's a very good answer because I mean it, it's tempting just to go well because. But actually, as you say, it, the fact that, that it does engender such a uh, such a interest from people and and you know sounds twee, but people I think people tend to forget that people in the past were people, don't they? Exactly. Um, and uh, and maybe just sort of just being able to say, look, here's a face from then. It, it can be a very powerful thing. So, um, wonderful, okay. So what, what's next then? What's next for you and, uh, and this project? Oh, what's next? Well, we've got lots of research that's currently been undertaken. Um, I found out earlier this year that my funding app application to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland had been successful. Okay. So um, what we're getting with that is um, a stable isotope analysis and that's going to tell us about uh, the origin um, between um, late um, childhood and early adulthood of where this person was. Okay. And it will also tell us about their diet 
um, which is really exciting. So whether, not not so much exactly what she was would have been eating, um, but whether she would have been eating um, terrestrial based resources or marine based resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting. Um, other research that we're having done, um, it's been included in one of the first large scale ancient DNA analysis projects, which has been carried out by the Natural History Museum. Um, I've been working with a guy called Dr. Tom Booth, who specialises in bone histology. Bone histology looks at the rate of bacterial decay in the bones mm -hmm. after um, after burial or after death, and it, um, you can tell um, whether this individual has been exhumed um, or mummified, right. or if they have been buried immediately after death. I don't have the results back for that or the ancient DNA yet. Um, but hopefully soon we'll find out something which will be very exciting. So, so presumably then what, what, what you're looking at there is sort of peaks and troughs in microbial activity following death. So if they're exhumed there'd be another peak or something over time. Um, I don't, I'm not, how it works is there's something called tunnelling which is, um, is the bacteria tunnelling th essentially through the bone. Mm can see the extent of it. Now the bacteria doesn't come from the surrounding environment, it's actually believed to be um, what's already in the gut mm -hmm. of the individual. So if somebody is mummified or exhumed, you see very, very limited amount of tunnelling um, because uh, the bacteria, it, it can't do what it, what it doesn't fester it, around the bones, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. mm -hmm. And if they um, have been buried um, immediately or within a short period after the burial, then you, you see extensive tunnelling. Right, right, okay, that's very interesting. Yes, wow. Yes. Um, okay, well, uh, I, I don't want to bend your ear too much, but that, that's, uh, that's been a very interesting insight into, into a news story. Thank you so much for offering your time, in fact, to talk about this. Uh, it's been very interesting. Uh, well, if anything particularly cool turns up in the next couple of months, do get in touch. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, the folks at home would love to hear more and um, also do pass on as well uh, my, uh, my thanks for your colleague's time as well I know you've had to sort of converse with him to you know get these details yeah. um, but no it's been grand um, and such a pleasure to meet you as well yes and to meet you too excellent Thank grand you. well um, <laughs> I suppose guys uh, as ever at home until next time do take care bye bye <laughs> there we go um,